every reputable church or historian has debunked all of this. But if you're a person who is essentially defending Adolf Hitler, minimizing his responsibility for the Second World War, I think you actually have gone perhaps down a very, very dark rabbit hole. So Rafe, I think that this has come at a fantastic time because there's been a massive historical debate happening over the last few weeks uh, when Daryl Cooper went on Tucker Carlson's podcast and labeled Winston Churchill the chief villain of World War II, which is a very, very interesting take. It's not a take that I've heard before. However, I will say that I listened to Daryl Cooper's Fear and Loathing in the New Jerusalem podcast, which was 30 hours long, and I found it fantastic. I was, I was really impressed by it. I learned a lot, researched a lot from it. And he's obviously got this World War II take coming out soon, which is not a take that I've really heard before. Um, what was your instant reaction to that? Well, look, I should say, you know, my, my Churchill qualifications, uh, I was the one of the youngest members ever of the International Churchill Society. I later served on its board of directors, did my master's thesis on Churchill as well. I was very pleased to actually be part of the Churchill team for the 2002 BBC series, Greatest Britons, which Churchill actually won. And in fact, you know, towards the end of her life, I was uh, an occasional companion for Churchill's daughter, Mary Soames, Lady Soames. Um, so I am, you know, intimately acquainted with the, with the great man's life. And I spent basically 30 years of my life studying him. And uh, unfortunately, there was nothing new in what Daryl Cooper has said. He hasn't uncovered anything new. This is all, uh, you know, I would say sort of neo-Nazi sympathizing uh, of the worst sort of revisionist kind. We've had it before with David Irving and others. Uh, most mainstream, I suppose, would have been Pat Buchanan spouting this. But every reputable church or historian has debunked all of this. Uh, and, and if you are a person, I would say, uh, I haven't heard his, his piece on the New Jerusalem and so forth, but if you're a person who is essentially defending Adolf Hitler, minimizing his responsibility for the Second World War, excusing some of the things that went on uh, under, his, under his watch, and at the same time, simultaneously attacking Winston Churchill, I think you need to have a long period of self-reflection and asking yourself uh, whether you actually have got perhaps down a very, very dark um, dark rabbit hole. And I say that not only of Daryl Cooper, I also say that of Tucker Carlson himself. Um, because, you know, look, some people have said, in fact, I think Andrew Roberts has, has said also, you know, a, a, an acquaintance of mine, colleague of mine, that, uh, you know, this guy should not have been platformed by Tucker Carlson. I'm a free speech advocate. I'm a free speech absolutist. And I don't believe anybody should be silenced uh, or not given a platform because the public forum is actually the place where you can expose the ludicrous nature of some of these claims. Um, and, you know, if you just silence them, and I think many people want to see done and take his people's videos off of YouTube, all you do is you give certain elements within our society the feeling that there must be something to it. If, you know, if the mainstream media and others are so quick to silence these people, that must mean that there is some kernel of truth at the bare minimum to what they're saying. Mm. So sunlight is, you know, obviously the best disinfectant. So I don't have an issue with Tucker Carlson platforming this guy. But what I do have an issue with in this debate, before we get into, into Daryl Cooper's own points, is that Tucker Carlson gave this man such undue praise. Literally, he called him the best, the most honest, and the, the, the most important historian in America. And, you know, that for anyone who has been a historian for years, that's quite a jaw-dropping statement to make because um, no uh, leading historian that I've ever seen has ever heard of this man before. He exists entirely online. Uh, great historians of the right, Niall Ferguson, you know, Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Roberts, They've never heard of him before. They've all now come out and, and debunked his claims. Uh, he's not a historian. He has not written a single history book. He has never studied history. He's not trained in the skills of a historian. I doubt he's been within 100 feet of an archive. And um, I suppose what you would have to say is if you're being generous, you call him an amateur historian. I would prefer to call him somebody who's a history, um, a history enthusiast. And I'm afraid all the stuff that he's been coming out with in these interviews is essentially secondhand knowledge, which is essentially regurgitation of, of books that we've had in the past. Uh, so I don't like this sort of, um, you know, the, the hagiography around this guy that, that um, 
Tucker Carlson has said. And I think it behooved him, if he's going to give this man a platform, he should actually have challenged the views that he made. You know, it's one thing to give somebody a platform, but if you are a skilled interviewer, even if you agree with the person you're interviewing, it's your duty. You have almost, when you're Tucker Carlson and you have such a large platform, you, you have a fiduciary duty, I would say, given how uh, how devoted your followers are to you, to actually really challenge this guy on what he's saying. And you can tell that this person isn't a real historian because, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, there was an interview on yesterday on television with Piers Morgan and Andrew Roberts. This BBC channel actually invited Daryl Cooper to take part in a debate on this channel for 5, 10, 15 minutes with Andrew Roberts. And he declined because he said, I respect Andrew Roberts. He knows far more about Churchill than I do. And I know that I would lose. And I find that remarkable because if you are coming out with something so incendiary, if you are making such controversial claims about a world figure, if you're actually boosting Nazi sympathizers with, with the, the attacks that you're making, you surely have a moral duty to actually stand by what you're saying and face up to a Churchill historian and say, well, look, this is my position. These are the facts. These are the claims. This is the evidence to back it up. And the fact that he didn't feel comfortable enough or secure enough in his knowledge to actually spend just five or ten minutes explaining his point against a real Churchill historian, I show you why this is thoroughly rotten, it's morally bankrupt, and it's very irresponsible and reckless of someone like him to say these things, given how many people who follow him will just follow him blindly. Hmm. Well, I think that the debate would definitely be something that I would love to see if if he were to take Andrew Roberts up on on that debate, because when you do make those claims in such a big platform and a public forum, I mean, go for it, but you have to be able to back it up 100%. And, exactly. and I do believe that, that Daryl Cooper will do that debate because, you know, uh, he's getting a lot of criticism at the moment, but I will say from what I've listened to of his podcasts, they are very insightful. And he does seem to be a guy who at least, at the very least, and if you might not call him a historian, but he, he reads a lot and he's come up with his, with his own perspectives. And I do hope that that happens. That would be, that would be amazing to see. Um, but in terms of the claims themselves, Rafe, just to sort of play devil's adv advocate a little bit here, I think that some of the the events that he's talking about are, for example, the bombing of Dresden and the internment camps set up uh, in peacetime. And then obviously there's all been a lot of, uh, there's been documentaries uh, circulating recently about, about the BBC documentary about what the Allies did during peacetime. And it's sort of reinvigorated this, this discussion about whether or not the Allies were really the good guys in the war and at the very least it should the discussion should be allowed to happen and i'm glad that it is happening but in on terms of the those claims on their face do you think that those were war crimes as well and do you think that there are events in world war ii that we can look at and say the allies were, were wrong there and they actually committed war crimes themselves yeah, so look, for example, Dresden, classic example here. Look, my family are Polish, but actually my family are ethnic Germans originally, and they came from Dresden. They left Dresden in, in 1697 to go down to Poland. Uh, what happened to Dresden was absolutely, uh, you know, I would say, in hindsight, absolutely unforgivable. But of course, you have to see things within the context of their time. Churchill himself uh, was haunted by Dresden. Um, the key thing to remember about Churchill was he learned a great lesson in the First World War at Gallipoli, which, of course, you know, being Australian will be very close to your hearts, too. And after Gallipoli and the Dardanelles campaign, he ensured that in the Second World War, he would not overrule his military commanders. And so Clement Attlee, the Labour leader, the future Labour prime minister, his, the, the leader of the opposition against him, said also that one of the reasons Churchill was a great leader, a great wartime leader and strategist, is he solved the dilemma that always handicaps democracies and war. And that's the battle between the elected leadership and the military leadership. Churchill felt confident enough to actually, well, he learned that the mistakes of the First World War were also that battle between the government and between the military uh, hampered severely the, the Allies in their war against Germany and so forth. And so in the Second World War, you didn't have that. That's one of the reasons why the, the Allies, why Britain and America were actually so much more successful in the war compared to, say, in Germany, where Hitler was always interfering, you know, just being a corporal and yet overruling his field marshals and generals and so forth, getting 
too involved, Churchill took a back seat. And he was opposed to the idea of, of uh, this sort of aerial bombardment for, for Dresden, also for the Ruhr as well. Uh, but he was, you know, but in the end, he had to agree to with what his military leaders and military commanders said. And for them, for the military commanders, it was a legitimate target because Dresden was actually the uh, center of communications and transport for that part of Germany. And there was a very real expectation that German forces would withdraw then to, to, to Dresden and make their last stand there. This is what Bomber Harris explained to Churchill as one of the justifications for it. And uh, also at the same time, you had pressure from Russia because Russia were trying to make their offensive into Germany and they wanted essentially to have the pathway before them flattened and made, made easy for their advance. And Dresden was one of the key areas which, was, which would have posed an obstacle to the Russians. Uh, you know, similarly, you can also make an argument that, you know, the, the, the terrible, you know, incendiary bombing of Dresden and so forth, hor horrific as they were, pale in comparison to the Americans' attack on, you know, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, pale in comparison to the Japanese murder of the Chinese, and of course, pale mm. in comparison <laughs> to the to, to the uh, to the Nazis murder, obviously, of, of the Jews and others. Um, but that's not to excuse it. And, and Churchill actually had tears in his eyes when he was discussing what happened in Dresden to his, his son, Randolph Churchill, at the time. And it was one of the great, and, he, and when it came to the rule bombing, he, he gave a speech, he wrote a pamphlet saying, are we beasts? And have we gone too far? So yeah, there's absolutely genuine areas for debate and criticism. And that's part of the broader point here, because Churchill wasn't perfect. No one is perfect. So there are areas you can debate. You can debate Churchill tying Britain to the gold standard when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. You could debate Churchill's policy on India. You could debate uh, Churchill and the abdication crisis. You could obviously di look, discuss Churchill in Gallipoli and the Dardanelles. But what you can't do is you can't make the sorts of claims that uh, Daryl Cooper makes in his uh interview with Carlson. I didn't hear Dresden ra raised. I heard him talking about the Black Forest bombing. I didn't hear him make Dresden. But the points that he makes in his in his talk, simply no decent historian would ever make those points because they're essentially in factually incorrect. And we can go into the actual, if you'd like to do, those key points that he makes in his uh, in his speech. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think we definitely should. But uh, when you look at uh, World War II, though, it's such a dark and disgusting part of human history and it, one of the things on the micro level when you look at people who return from war they generally have ptsd and ptsd because of what they've seen but also ptsd because of what they've done uh, that's another big part of why people return from war with ptsd and then i think that there's a real hangover when you when you when you go to war and then you come home and you realize gosh like it's 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 terrible what human beings are capable of but then with World War II, we have that on such a bigger scale where we're all sort of looking back on it even 80 years later thinking, I can't believe that that our people were involved in that, were we were we lied to about the narrative. So as, as bad as it is, it is an interesting discussion to be having with a historian, for me anyway. Um, but yeah, definitely, let's get into some of those claims specifically that you noted. Yeah, all right. Well, I mean, just on the, on the more silly and superficial level, he said, you know, he accused Churchill of being a psychopath. Well, I'm sorry, psychopaths don't have empathy or emotion. I've just described to you Churchill crying when he was discussing what happened in Dresden. Similarly, when he heard about the fate of the Jews, uh, there are so many examples during the Second World War. Even Clement Attlee, the Labour leader, remarks about how Churchill was so visibly moved when he heard about the atrocities and horrors of, of wartime of wartime Europe and what was going on there. Also, just when he was received by by by, by the crowds in, in Britain, he got emotionally taken up by all of that. He was a deeply romantic man. He was a you know a character from the 18th century in terms of very visibly displaying his emotions, much like Admiral Lord Nelson was was didn't have a, any problem being seen weeping or so forth so the he had so much humanity for people the idea that he was a, a psychopath is, is simply stupid you also you know daryl cooper who is just you know an online presence only in sort of on substack and podcasts also accuses you know uh winston churchill of being childish you know this is a man 
who had won the Nobel Prize for Literature, led two governments, you know, was a reformer, liberal reformer with uh, David Lloyd George, fought in five wars, was a great buccaneer. I mean, of all the people in the world you could call childish, Churchill is the last one. He was he bestrode the globe as a great towering figure. And you don't get that by by being childish. But you know, getting onto the other points that he makes, so you know, he says that, for example, Churchill uh, expanded the war beyond uh, beyond Poland. Well, I'm sorry, Winston Churchill uh, was not the one who did that. That there was a phony war for eight months between September the first, between September the third, 1939, uh, and for the next eight months until May 1940 when uh, Hitler invaded the Low Countries and France. You know, Churchill wasn't prime minister at this time. It was Hitler who expanded the war beyond, beyond Poland into Western Europe. Um, what else did he do? Well, he also demonizes, you know, when, when Churchill then became prime minister with Chamberlain stepping down, and Daryl Cooper says that Churchill demonized Chamberlain. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, what did Churchill do? You know, Chamberlain felt broken. Churchill brought Chamberlain back into the cabinet immediately, and Chamberlain became one of his great supporters because finally the scales had fallen from Chamberlain's eyes. He realized you could not appease Hitler. That would not work. And uh, when Chamberlain died, Churchill delivered one of the greatest speeches of his life when he paid tribute to him and delivered that eulogy. So a completely nonsensical thing for him to say there. He then goes into the whole aspect of the peace uh, parlies uh, that Count Ciano, uh, the Italian, was uh, conducting on behalf of the Nazis with, with the British in terms of could we get a peace settlement with Britain, uh, and that these were rejected and rebuffed by, by Britain and also by France, it has to be said. And there's no surprise that these were going to be rebuffed. The first thing was, by the, by the time we were having these peace treaties, uh, these peace negotiations started by Hitler through his intermediaries, Hitler realized that he couldn't actually successfully invade Britain at that point. You know, Britain, you know, was very extremely weak. It had lost the, the you know, it was, it was lost the continent of Europe, but the Royal Navy was still the world's largest feet, uh, fleet. Hitler wasn't able to secure uh, uh, mastery in the air. And without, you know, without being able to neutralize the British fleet, without mastery in the air, it was clear that uh, the uh, the path to victory over Britain wasn't obvious. There was no way to do an invasion. And so Hitler quite obviously wanted to turn his attention instead onto Russia and focus 100% of his energy on Russia. He thought that would be easier. They thought they could do it in a matter of days, knock Russia out of the war. And with Russia knocked out of the war, they could then come back and focus their energy on Britain 100% too. And, you know, with this, the scale of Russia's decline, hopefully even get uh, uh, Britain to negotiate a better peace treaty. But, of course, the British knew full well that they would be vassals to Hitler. You often are told, oh, Hitler loved Britain. He wanted Britain to keep its empire and so forth. He didn't love Britain. He didn't like Britain. He admired Britain. He had huge admiration for Britain and the way that Britain developed its empire. But make no mistake, if Britain had had a peace deal with Germany, particularly at that point when, when Germany was master of Europe, Britain would have been a vassal state, would probably have had to surrender its fleet or its fleet would have gone over to Canada. And there's every chance that you would have had a quizzling uh, government in place in Britain, perhaps led by Oswald Mosley of the British Union of Fascists or a sort of Vichy Pétain, David Lloyd George, a sort of a Vichy France style thing, essentially another sort of quizzling to Adolf Hitler. Uh, and you would be living at the point of a gun next to some sort of schizophrenic, because you have to remember Hitler tore up every single peace treaty, every single treaty that he that he signed. You know, he went into uh, he went into the Rhineland, uh, he went into the Sudetenland. He then tore up that Munich Agreement and went into all of Czechoslovakia. He then, you know, he tore up his Nazi the Nazi Soviet non aggression pact and invaded Russia. There was no treaty that he didn't tear up. There is no reason to suspect that he would have adhered to or, uh, you know, abided by the peace treaty terms with Britain. Because remember, he also had Napoleon always in the back of his mind. When he conquered Paris, when he famously went to Paris, he went to the Pantheon, he stood over Napoleon's tomb. And he described that as the finest and most important 
moment of his life. And he wanted to achieve what Napoleon couldn't achieve, conquering Russia and conquering Britain. That had stumped Napoleon. And I have no doubt that if he had, uh, well, in fact, Joseph Stalin and Nikita Khrushchev both said that if Britain had been defeated or if Britain had had peace terms with Germany, Germany would have had 100% of its forces against Russia compared to only having 70% as it turned out in the Second World War. And if it had been a single front war between Russia and the Soviet, between the Soviet Union and Germany, Stalin and Khrushchev both said Hitler would have won. And that meant that the Axis powers in Germany would have controlled Europe, they would have controlled Russia, they would have controlled the Middle East oil fields, they would have controlled Africa, and with Japan, they would have controlled Asia. And of course, once they had coalesced and restored their forces after fighting Russia, how could Britain have possibly withstood that mm. complete domination? And then uh, conquering Britain as well, uh, the Axis powers could, could look towards America. That's why you had FDR's famous Arsenals of Democracy speech where he said, if Great Britain goes down, the Axis powers will control Africa, Australia, Asia, and we in the Americas will be living at the point of a gun. And the other important thing to mention there is that, of course, the British scientists were the ones who helped the Americans with the Manhattan Project for nuclear weapons. If Germany had conquered Britain, those, those uh, tube alloy scientists who were developing nuclear weapons would have worked with the Germans, and the Germans would most probably have got the nuclear bomb first, and then we'd be talking about a very different world indeed. So I think it's, it's quite immature to attribute Hitler's motives as being completely altruistic in reaching out for a peace agreement. Hmm. It's interesting when you look at when I look at I haven't actually thought about it from from that regard in terms of his sort of um, admiration of Napoleon and him wanting to follow in Napoleon's footsteps because the way that I when I look at Hitler I think that his prime enemy was Bolshevism in Russia and Europe was under this sort of Bolshevism versus fascism battle and that he wanted to defeat the Bolsheviks and create this new sort of third Reich I guess he wanted to create the new the new great Roman society and then Britain was just sort of it wasn't necessarily a primary enemy of his but it was just a hindrance to his to his goal so um I haven't really thought about it that way but you're saying that Britain was was just as much of an enemy to Hitler as the Soviets were no not just as much of an Britain wasn't an enemy uh <coughs> Bolsh Bolshevik Russia was an enemy. He had, of course, grievances with France, which is why, of course, he had the French sign their peace treaty in the railway coach at Compiègne, where, which, of course, was the, sign, was the site of the great humiliation of Germany after World War I. But Hitler was a conqueror, and, and, and once he had complete domination of the continent of Europe, this was still a man who thought about Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon. He saw himself in those sorts of messianic, you know, giants of history's term, and he was thinking about his global legacy. And uh, there's no reason to think that this is not actually how the game would have ended. There's every we, we know that's how it would have gone. And of course, the other point to make here is that all the time we're talking about uh, potential peace negotiations or a peace treaty, if Britain had signed a peace treaty with Germany, we're all forget we're forgetting about all of the nations of Europe that were under the Nazi jackboot. We're not talking about just the Jews. We're talking about the Slavs, who were essentially going to be the slave labor, who were also being murdered, uh, in, uh, you know, in the most gruesome and brutal ways. Uh, also put into concentration camps. We're talking about the free peoples of Europe in Western Europe, who are also having democracy extinguished and living under the the totalitarian regime enforced by by the Gestapo and so forth. So there's an un, you know none of this was discussed by Daryl Cooper or Tucker Carlson. The reality of what would be a, what the peoples of Europe would be left to had Britain actually decided to uh, to uh, to surrender, or if, if Britain had been defeated. You know there are very few times in history when the expression "cometh the hour, cometh the man" is more important. And uh, I don't think there's a, there was another point in world history where the future of Western civilization and the free world rested upon one man's shoulders as it did for the 12 months from the fall of France and Dunkirk in May, June 1940, up to Operation Barbarossa in, in June 1941, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. That year, Britain, along with its empire, but in terms of the continent of Europe, Britain stood alone with resources so slender you can't even begin to, to, to imagine it. And that year gave the world the chance to rearm and prepare
for the war and it kept the the, the flame of freedom and liberty burning until the miracles of, of Russian and American engagement were allowed to happen, which of course ended up signing the death warrant of uh, of Adolf Hitler. And But do remember, Hitler invaded Russia. Hitler declared war on America. Churchill didn't drag uh, America into that war, although he really wanted America to come in. That was an initiative mm -hmm. of Adolf Hitler there. But again, even with Daryl with Cooper, he actually says, was bizarrely, uh, that Hitler didn't regard the Russia as being any longer uh, the center of communist in, uh, communist international movement, which is, of course, uh, you're quite correct, completely wrong with all of the historical evidence we know. He also says that he invaded that Hitler invaded Russia because he thought Stalin was was uh, to preempt an attack by Stalin, and that he was worried that Stalin was going to uh, invade Romania's oil fields. I'm sorry. The man clearly hasn't read Mein Kampf because it's quite clear. We all know about Lebensraum and the policy that Hitler had for giving living space to the Germanic peoples, and that included settling Poland, you know, Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, and uh, having an exodus of the population through there. And he ridiculously says that the reason so many Russian prisoners of war died was because the Germans weren't prepared to have so many prisoners of war and didn't know where or how to house them. I mean, that's absolutely outrageous. This is sort of, you know, first year university level essay submission. It's all there in the documentary evidence. We can see that the deliberate policy of the Germans was to expunge and eradicate the Russians, especially with food shortages being so slow. They wanted to exterminate as many Slavs as possible. We saw that in Poland. In fact, members of my own family who were part of the intelligentsia, the clear policy of the Germans was to eradicate the Polish elite the Polish officer class, uh, and also do that to the Russian officer class and Russian, Russian elites, so there wouldn't be any chance of a counter counterfight from them, and then to basically remove the, the, the masses of the population. And Cooper somehow glides over all of that and says it's because the, the Germans were poorly prepared. Either he's being rather disingenuous there, or he just simply doesn't know his history. Mm. And another one that gets talked about quite a lot in this discussion is the unholy alliance between the Allies and between the Soviets um, to defeat the Nazis. When you see the old footage, the old black and white footage of Churchill and Stalin together making making alliances, uh, strange bedfellows to say the least, con considering the ideological differences. And then also during peacetime, when the Soviet, what the Soviets did to the Germans when when they infiltrated. Um, German land. So, upon reflection, was was that something that we can look back at as uh, an unholy alliance and something that shouldn't have taken place, or was that a necessary evil? It was absolutely fundamental. If Germany, if you know, one of the things behind appeasement, of course, everybody was hoping that um, before Hitler became too, uh, you know, too had too much of an appetite for for domination in the West, that that fascism and communism would go to war. All the democracies were hoping that these two great evil ideologies would go head to head against each other. Uh, and if that hadn't happened on the Eastern Front, then, you know, the war would have been extremely di different. You have to remember, of course, that the Russians took the great bunt, the great uh, brunt of, uh, of, of Nazi power. And then the Russian front was much more as severe, as you, as you well know, than on the Western front. But look, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. There was no greater foe of Bolshevism than Winston Churchill, you know, when after the Russian Revolution, he said that we should strangle, strangle the baby Bolshevism in its cradle. He wanted to actually, you know, launch a war against the Bolsheviks. Uh, his whole life was dedicated to, uh, you know, to fighting communism. But as he said in the House of Commons, when he was asked about uh, allying with Stalin, he said, well, if Hitler invaded hell, I would at least make a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons. Mm. So you have to understand who your greater enemy is. And what you see about Churchill is that at the at the end of the Second World War, in 1945, when American forces were still on the ground in Europe, Churchill wanted to launch what's called Operation Unthinkable. He wanted British, Polish, uh, and American forces, along, I suppose, with the Canadians who were also there, he wanted them to push further into Germany, past Berlin, push into Poland, and push the Red Army out of Europe. Churchill saw the threat from the communists. He wanted to, now that the Nazis, who were the number one threat, had gone, he wanted to push communism out of Europe. But by that point, you know, the military, the armies of America were so tired, the war had been raging for so long, it was so expensive, 
and they and they didn't see Bolshevism for the danger that Churchill did. Churchill was far more clued in. And of course, so if we had followed him, the map of Europe could have been very different and the Iron Curtain would have been pushed much further east. Perhaps there would have been no Iron Curtain. And who coined the phrase Iron Curtain? Churchill in 1946 in Fulton, Missouri in America, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. It was Churchill who was the first person to make the world aware of the true intentions of Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union, just as it was Churchill who had been the first person to warn the world about the evils of Adolf Hitler and his true plans. And of course, as he was also in the First World War, he was one of the first to also warn about the impending clouds of war gathering in 1914. So there's every reason to look towards him as being one of those few people gifted with the foresight to see the world around him as it really was. Right. And in terms of Churchill's uh, own character, the other things that have come into scrutiny is that saying that he was a drunk and uh, you, we, we debunked the about him being childish and being a psychopath. Um, but was his decisions, were they hindered at all by his, uh, his affinity for alcohol and cigars? No, look, no one is going to say that Churchill didn't drink a lot. Uh, kindred spirit of mine on that front, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, as he often said, I've taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. And as Andrew Roberts has, has shown, having gone through all of the Churchill archives, there's only one day in the six years of the Second World War when he was believed to have been tipsy. So amazing, given all the pressures he was under in 1939 to 1945, only one day was he actually thought to be tipsy, and all they did was they just held the meeting again the next day. Uh, Churchill famously, you know, used to enjoy having uh, champagne at breakfast. Um, but you know, I got to, as I said, I got to know his daughter Mary Soames, and she, you know, she said what he would drink in the, throughout the morning and, and afternoon was what we called Papa's cocktail. And it was a, a, a Scotch and whiskey, but the whiskey was essentially just, you know, enough to cover the bottom of the glass. The rest of it was water. This was so essentially it was called what his secretary, Jock Colville, called it was mouthwash. It was just water with a splash of whiskey in it, uh, hardly you know, alcoholic at all. Something that many people from his era learned when they were in the British Empire. If you were in India and Africa and elsewhere, you couldn't trust the water so much. You would put a, a splash of alcohol in it to try to sterilize it. He had an, he acquired a taste for it. So whilst you would see with a glass, the fact is it was probably in about 1% or 0% alcohol. Not, not true. Um, so again, these are just canards that have come up that he was a, that he was a drunken and so forth. Hitler liked to perpetuate this. People who are sympath sympathizers with Hitler and also people on the far left like to like to support these sorts of crazy ways to denigrate and besmirch his reputation. But I'm afraid they simply don't hold true. Yes, and I think that there are a lot of people who enjoy who enjoy alcohol a little bit more than they should, and it doesn't really affect their character too much. Yeah. Um, now. Another thing that's been popping up recently, I've seen when this debate has been happening on Twitter, a lot of people have been posting Winston Churchill's articles that he was writing about Zionism and Bolshevism being the battle for the Jewish heart or the battle for the Jewish soul or identity. What, what was that all about? So, well, it was undeniable that many Bolsheviks were Jewish, but, you know, as Churchill would have said, um, many Bolsheviks are Jews, but most Jews aren't Bolsheviks. Uh, Churchill was very rare and unique for his time, for a 19th century Victorian uh, gentleman to be a philo-Semite rather than an anti-Semite, as were most of his compatriots at the time. Uh, his father had Jewish friends, Churchill had great Jewish friends growing up and then throughout his life. And he regarded the Jews as being a remarkable minority who had achieved who had achievements that were far out of proportion to the size of their demographic. And he saw the uh, Western civilization as having many of its roots were fundamentally, in his view, uh, came out of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And so he had great affinity to the Jews, much more than, say, to the Arabs. And so, you know, he, th there's no denying what he said. You've got to remember, of course, this was a man who was born in the era of Charles Darwin, who believed in the... Uh, hierarchy of, of races and so forth which was entirely normal for the time however abhorrent people may find that today that was just accepted science of the time 
And he's quite clearly said, you know, if it wasn't, you know, uh, you know, Palestine and these part, and these regions in the Arab world would have remained unchanged for thousands, tens of thousands of years if they had been left to their own devices. You wouldn't have verdant gardens and uh, 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 all of the architecture and the civilization there if they had been left to their own devices that the British brought there. And then with the uh, with the state of Israel being created, that was then also able to create a prosperous nation which had pro previously been barren and desert-like. And so he made no, you know, he made no a secret of his great admiration for the genius of the Jews, particularly he would say compared to uh, their neighbors. If you enjoyed that reality-based podcast clip, make sure to subscribe to the reality-based YouTube channel. We'll be uploading many clips and the full podcast, and also. If you prefer the audible version, you can check us out on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at Reality Based.